the people that were involved in these things, uh, I, I'm learning a lot. But when I get to Dick Cheney and I'm interviewing him, I had no idea, by the way, this is like 1995, 96. I had no idea this guy's going to become our, our vice president. I'm doing this interview and I'm asking him about the 80s. And he's got this white phone on his desk and his phone's got a halo on it. I was kind of curious, just like you would be. I asked him, I said, well, what's with the phone, Mr. Secretary? He was, you know, former Secretary of Defense under uh, uh, Bush 41. He said, Rick, that's a direct line to God. He said, you can use it, just pay me back. That thing is 500 bucks a minute for, for every minute you're on. So, I, of course, I'm going to talk to God, right? I get on the phone, pay him 500 bucks a minute. I get back to Texas. I'm interviewing the governor of Texas, George Bush. He's got a white phone with a halo. I said, Governor, can I use that direct line to God? He said, you bet. Pay me back. That thing's five bucks a minute. I said, wait, wait, Governor, that's the Secretary of Defense. That's over all the states, 500 bucks a minute. You're Governor of one state telling me it's only five bucks. He said, boy, you've forgotten where you are. He said, this is Texas. It's God's country. It's a local call from here in Austin. <laughs> now, come on, even you liberals have to laugh at that. That was funny, all right? Come on, all right. So much for making you laugh. Okay, let's move on. This case out of Texas, it's the little school district, Santa Fe, outside of Houston. This is where we had the case dealing with prayer at a football game. Prior to that, we had the case dealing with prayer at a graduation. The question of the case was not if I, as a speaker, could come in and pray, or a pastor, or a rabbi, or anything like that. The question was, can a student, one of the graduating students at their own graduation, get up and say a prayer? Federal court said, yes, this court will allow prayer if it's a typical non-denominational prayer. The prayer can refer to God or the Almighty, but the prayer must not. Refer to Jesus. Make no mistake, this court's going to have a United States Marshal in attendance at the graduation. And if any student attempts, to win, if any student offends this court and mentions Jesus in a prayer, that student will be summarily arrested and face six months incarceration. Now, what was the crime? Mentioning the name of Christ at a public school graduation. Just last year, or no, two years ago, in Nevada, we had a graduation where a gal was going to mention her faith in Christ as part of her valedictorian speech, talking about what she thought had made her successful. They shut the microphone off on her. Couldn't allow anyone to hear those words uttered at a public graduation. This year, we had a gal actually mention her faith in Christ. The mic was still on. The public school made her publicly apologize for mentioning the name of Christ at a public school graduation before she could get her diploma. Now, this is very, very different from what John Adams said. He said the general principles upon which the founders achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. He said we as a nation are founded on these general principles of Christianity, but yet today, 230 years later, you mention his name, you can actually be arrested. Something dramatic has changed in our culture. We do not know what the Founding Fathers truly believed. So let's capture these guys very quickly. Now, we're, we're not going to be able to cover all 250 Founding Fathers. We'll do some. Sorry about this. This is going to screw All right, there we go. Uh, we, do not, we don't have time to cover all 250. We could, but I'm afraid we'd be here a little bit late, Danny. No more food. But we'll cover as many as possible. This is kind of that part where I have to warn you. David Barton and I both, we get accused of talking 90 words a minute with gust up to about 350. In order to get as many of these guys in as possible, I'm going to speed up. We're going to gust on up to about 350. Let's just start with the father of the country, George Washington. Everybody in this room knows Washington. Now, if you want to know whether or not a founding father was a man of faith, you go talk to their friends. You go interview the people that spent time with them. You read the original documents. Read the books and the journals of the people that spent time with them. You can do that with Washington. You can read General Henry Knox, for instance. A guy that served with Washington throughout the Revolutionary War. Talks over and over in his journal how he would walk in on President Washington, or General Washington accidentally interrupted him. Guess what he's doing? He's praying. What? He's praying. Same thing in Congress. Secretary Thompson talks in his journal about walking in on President Washington accidentally interrupting him. Kneeling in prayer. You go to Valley Forge today, big bronze monument of Washington. He's kneeling in prayer. Down the street, there's a stained glass window of George Washington kneeling in prayer. Uh, you go to Washington, D.C. right now, you can see this private prayer room of the congressman at the Capitol. It's Washington kneeling in prayer. You've all seen these paintings in Washington kneeling in prayer. Doesn't it surprise you, though, that, that an atheist founding father would spend this much time praying? I, I mean, think about it. If our Christians today, if the religious people in America today would pray as much as our atheists, supposedly atheist founding fathers would pray, the nation would probably be a little bit better off. Whether you believe in God or not, it'd probably be good for us to be doing that. It's not just Washington, though. How about Gouverneur Morris? If you were educated 50 years ago in this nation, your textbook would have included Gouverneur Morris. Not today. He's not politically correct. Probably nobody in the room that even recognizes his name or his face. He was a signer of the Constitution, most active man at the Constitutional Convention than anybody else, spoke 173 times there on the floor of the convention. We don't know anything about the guy. You might recognize his handiwork. He's the penman of the Constitution. It's the guy that wrote the Constitution. He probably knew what he was supposed to do, not supposed to do, what we were trying to do here with an American society. Here's why he won't read about it today. He said, religion is the only solid basis of good morals. Therefore, education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man towards God. 
Wait, wait a minute now. Our Supreme Court says education, religion, keep those two as far apart as possible because of the Constitution. Yet here's the guy that gave us the Constitution. He's saying they should be working side by side for a good culture. Same thing with James. Oops, I don't have a slide in there. James Wilson, he's the second most active member of the Constitution Convention. And we text him to two and second like this if there's any football fans in the room. Anyway, um, he's the second most active. He speaks 168 times. There on the floor of the convention. He also signed the Declaration. He signs the Declaration, signs the Constitution, influences the Constitution more than anybody else except Gouverneur Morse. George Washington names him to the Supreme Court, so he's an original Supreme Court justice, serves on the Supreme Court, writes legal commentaries on the Constitution, starts our law school system in America. If there's an expert on the Constitution and the law, this is the guy, okay? He said, human law must rest its authority ultimately upon that law which is divine. Far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters. They're friends. They're mutual assistants. Indeed, these two sciences run into each other. I mean, they work side by side like a couple of oxen, bringing us a good culture, good society. Human law, that's our, legis that's our the laws our legislatures make across the nation, Congress makes. He's saying it should be based on that higher law, that religion must be involved. And we always hear, well, you can't define marriage as one man and one woman because that's bringing the Bible into our statutes, into our government. Well, we couldn't do that. It's exactly what the Founding Fathers told us to do. Base your human law on the higher law if you want to have a nation that enjoys freedom. Now, you probably recognize these guys here. That's the 56 supposed atheists uh, that signed the Declaration of Independence. Now, we're not only are we told they're atheists, they're supposedly enemies of Christ. Now, if you're an enemy of Christ... What do you do as a hobby in 1776? I mean, come on, there's lots you can do today, right? If you're an enemy of Christ today, no big deal. Plenty to do. But if you live in 1776, what do you do in your spare time? Let's take a look at these atheist enemies of Christ and what they were doing in their spare time. This fellow right here, that's the Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon. Now, if you think that's unusual, having a pastor in Congress, 24 of the 56 signers held seminary degrees. And that's pretty good to get a bunch of atheists, enemies of Christ, to go to seminary. I'm sure they were just doing opposition research. They weren't actually there because they were following Christ or anything. But, by the way, Witherspoon there, you're looking at the Billy Graham of that generation. He was the best-known evangelist throughout the colonies. We have dozens and dozens of his sermons, very popular sermons, in our collection there at Wall Builders. And he's responsible for two American translations of the Bible. Here we have Secretary Thompson, responsible for the Thompson Bible. You can get today at uh, your Christian bookstore, Thompson Bible. He spent 25 years of his life translating the Greek Septuagint into English. Benjamin Rush, I mentioned to you earlier, started that Philadelphia Bible Society. Within a few years, these founding fathers had dozens and dozens of Bible societies. Now, what would the purpose of a Bible society be? Any ideas? Help me out here. To read the Bible. Read the Bible, and, and what else? Distribute the Bible. Get it out there. Get, get people to, to, to take the Bible and learn it. Now, what are these atheist enemies of Christ doing involved in these Bible societies? I can't imagine why they would do that in their spare time. Now, Benjamin, Benjamin Rush, by the way, now a lot of people look at this picture. I was told in law school, all slave owners. Why should we listen to anything they say? Rick, you say we were founded on absolute truths, but I, they, these guys were all slave owners. How can we want, want to listen to anything that they say? I know today that three-fourths of the men in that picture were abolitionists. I didn't know that when I was in law school. I had to go study each of their individual lives. Some of them actually wanted independence specifically to get rid of slavery. Rush was one of those. He and Benjamin Franklin together started the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. It was actually in response to what King George had done. We had abolished slavery in Three states in 1773. Their home state of Pennsylvania abolishes in 1774. But King George vetoed all four laws. Said, you guys are going to keep it whether you want it or not. Those two guys got together, Rush and Franklin, in an act of civil disobedience. They started that and said, we want to change this. It's one of the reasons we want uh, our independence. They thought we would actually end slavery when we got our independence. Georgia and South Carolina had other ideas but couldn't get unanimous consent on the Declaration with Jefferson's words against slavery. It took that 75 years and a lot of bloodshed to make the principles that these guys gave us actually apply to all Americans. My point is that many of these guys were on the right side of that argument from day one. <clears throat> in fact, oh, I thought I had them in there. Man, I got too many of my slides missing. Um, some of the greatest patriots, some of the greatest heroes of the Revolutionary War were black patriots fighting side by side with white patriots. The hero of Bunker Hill is a guy named Peter Salem, black patriot there. Uh, when you see that painting of, of Washington crossing the Delaware, the two patriots in the front of the boat, that's Oliver Cromwell and Prince Whipple, two black patriots that served with Washington throughout the war. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of James Armistead. He's my favorite of all of them. I call him the James Bond of the Revolutionary War. This guy was actually a double agent for Lafayette. He, he convinced uh, Cornwallis that he was a runaway slave. He said, I want to help you defeat the, defeat the Americans. And uh, Cornwallis took him in. 
He said, I'm a runaway slave, and I don't like these guys, and I want, I want the British to win. So Cornwallis actually brings him into his camp. 